Hello, Spokane, Washington, and welcome back to another episode of Evil Real Talks. This is Matt Side, and I'm joined by the lovely Jessica Side. Hi, here everybody. In, here <laughs> in Studio D on the Lower South Hill. We're going to be talking about ADUs today. <laughs> what do you think that's funny? I do. I think you're a goofball sometimes. He's like sometimes. staring at me. It makes sometimes me uncomfortable. I, well, we're in a radio station. I know. <laughs> uh, we promised two weeks ago that we would talk about accessory dwelling units. Mm-hmm. Those are abbreviated as ADUs. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to give some quick context around what an accessory dwelling unit is, is basically a secondary living space on your current property. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's all sorts of interesting things about that that Jessica's going to enlighten us. I'm actually going to give you a proper definition. Oh, let's Let's, let's have go. the proper definition here for an ADU. is a separate additional living unit, including separate kitchen, sleeping, and bathroom facilities attached or detached from the primary residential unit on a single family lot. That is a better definition. However, I do feel like I covered that in my explanation. You think so? Pretty much. Okay, great. Well, so w- this would would this be what uh, mm-hmm. they would have termed when we first got into the business is the mother-in-law yes. unit or something and like mother, that. And mother that's definitely like one of the terms that's used. There's some other terms out there that I think are kind of not as nice. So I'm not even going to say them. <laughs> okay. Want me to tell you what they are? I, I do. I mean, I don't know how unnice I it don't. is. It's granny flat. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> granny flat. I don't like that at all. Oh my God. If we ever do one of these, I'm so calling it the granny that's flat. That's not what we're going to be calling it. Hey kids, um, I'm going to be out in the granny flat. <laughs> God, it's horrible. <laughs> um, so, what else? I mean, seriously. What no, that's, else that's, the, that's the one oh. that's the worst. Um, and these are actually, it's interesting because as you do research on these, you find that they are in pretty much every country in the world because until the early 1900s, actually mid-1900s when it became unpopular, um, it was very common to have an additional living space for an aging parent or, or a family member. People lived more communally in sure. the United States, where in other, other countries they still do. They never really stopped doing that. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing, and we want to talk about it um, because we've been doing research on it. Um, and so there's some interesting information about it. Um, we're finding that it's a possible good you know, if you have a family member that maybe needs a place and you want it to be close by, you don't want to have to buy a whole separate, you know, lot, whether that's a child or a parent or an aunt or an uncle or whoever it might be, sure. it could be a good option for them. Well, and, f- and for example, somebody that's got a smaller footprint in their house, Yep. instead of moving to another house, especially, we're going to talk about numbers in a little while when mm-hmm. there's so little inventory out there. Right. Maybe a good option for you is to leverage the equity in your current home and and expand, like make that the guest suite or right. suites. Yeah. So here's, I think... <coughs> I think I might have just talked myself out of a job on that one. <laughs> I think Don't an interesting... Sell, just build an ADU. <laughs> ADU. Well, there's some a few things that I think are going to be important for us to understand. First of all, does it really add value to your house? And I think that's the question you have to start with. And... All indications show that it absolutely does. Um, there is one study that shows that it increases the value of the house from 20 to 30 percent. And there's another Oregon study. In Oregon, they saw it add 51 percent really to the value of someone's home. Half again. So if your home is so worth- as long as you don't spend over fi- in that area, for example, right. as long as you don't spend more than fifty percent of your home's value, you're right. going to get that back out when you sell. Correct. So in California, uh, they did a study that that concluded that <clears throat> ADUs generally um, contribute twenty five to thirty four percent of each property's assessed value. Okay, assessed value. So that's what you get taxed on. So your taxes will increase if you have an ADU. Sure. Um, but that the when they resell the house again 51%. So this is, you know, three different studies from three different places. Interesting. Um, so the California study said 51% as well. 51% in resale value and only 25 to 34% in Tax taxable value. taxable value. Well, I know that uh, your one of your younger brothers when they were looking for a property, they literally were only looking at properties that had ADUs. Mm. Because for them, they they weren't worried about people staying with them. Right. They are very entrepreneurial and they're like, 
sweet, we can rent it out and somebody right. can help us make our mortgage payment. And an ADU could be internal <coughs> or external. So it could be something that you have, you know, out in the back of your house above a garage, but it also could be a, a basement that you um, convert. Well, and to clarify, out in the back doesn't always have to be above the garage. Like that's, no. a, that's an option, right. but it can be a standalone building. Correct. Uh, what other, what sort of limitations so, are there? Maybe you could just share, okay, I'm somebody out there that's thinking of building an ADU in my yeah. property. Like, where do I even start? So Spokane has some rules. Can you believe it? Um, there are rules. Now, these are general rules. There's more specific rules that you will want to watch for. But first of all, the minimum is your lot has to be at least 5,000 square feet. So if you're under 5,000 square feet, you're not going to be able to build an ADU. Okay. Okay. Um, now, if um, your house itself is less than 800 square feet, you also cannot do an ADU. Oh, really? Correct. Yeah. So you got to have at least 800 square feet. So you can't put two tiny homes on a lot. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Is that, okay, let me ask you this clarifying mm -hmm. question. Is that 800 square feet total square footage or footprint? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Is it the footprint? I believe it's the footprint. Okay. So I mean, that would make sense. So it they're, could be your up or your down. They're trying to make sure that the additional unit is not bigger than. And don't hold me to that because I'm not. I'm not seeing well, that information in the stuff We should have had a disclaimer at the beginning. Oh of yeah, this the, that we're not the, the footprint of the principal structure, excluding an attached garage must be not less than 800 square feet. So right. that is the footprint. So here's a couple of things. Um, there's some limit limitations. The ADU cannot be larger than your primary dwelling. So you can't sure. have an 800 square foot home and build a 1,000 square foot ADU. Not going to work. Limitation number two is that the deta a detached accessory structure cannot be more than 15% of your total area. The so lot size. The lot size. Okay. So those are all some limitations. You also have, you can't be less than 250 square feet, and it can't be more than 800 square feet. The, the unit? And actually, actually, that's internal. So that's an internal ADU, cannot be less than 250 square feet. So if you're going to build see. something building in your basement. I, I see, okay. Right? And it can't be more than 800. So if you've got a big basement. I mean, that's basement, pretty small, basically. I mean, you yes. basically could have a separate entrance into a single room in your basement. Right. That's a 10 by 25 room. Except and that's for 250 your, square Right. Feet. And then, but you've got to have the kitchen and the bathroom for it to be considered that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and then a detached. How can you get smaller there's than not a, Detached, there's not a minimum, which I think is kind of interesting. They don't have a minimum, but they do have a maximum of 600 square feet. Now, I don't know if there are some, there are some um, changes possibly to that, depending on your specific circumstance. Um, but according to this, it's 600 square feet is the biggest you can do. Okay. Um, so. It's, but you can have 800 square feet in your home? So if you yes. did it in your basement, you can do it bigger than if you had a separate... Yes. Dwelling outside. Oh, That's what this is saying. And this is, I, I pulled this from um, the city of Spokane. So the municipal code is like 17C.300 or something like that. And we could probably link that to the show Yeah, we could do that for sure. And on our Facebook and stuff. Um, so here's some things that as, as I have um, looked into something like this, the first thing I did is do my own calculations. So I pulled up all the setbacks because you have to have it set back a certain amount of area. I kind of... You know, I got my grid paper out and I kind of started drawing what that would look like. And then I brought a contractor in. So bringing a contractor in, asking him some questions, trying to figure out how much is this going to cost me to do. Step So step one is, is my lot big enough? Yep. Is my house big enough? Mm -hmm. and, and then do I have enough space? Like what was the, I mean, is that would be that kind of the next... Yeah, I mean, I wanted to make sure I wanted to make sure a we could do it, and b that whatever the setbacks would be oh, sure. didn't take up my whole backyard because that for me was really important. I don't want to lose my entire backyard. And that's to... a, that's individual to the person. Sure. But again, this is a real estate show, and I'll just say that if you take up your entire backyard with your accessory dwelling unit, you've just limited the number of buyers that are going right. to want your house. So unless you're planning on living there forever, and then you know, whoever your heirs are are going to have to deal with it. Somebody's <laughs> going to have to sell that house yeah. at some point in the future. So think a little bit further forward. Yeah. But some people, it's, that's more important to them. And if it's more important to you, and you will eventually, you'll find someone that that will work for them as well. Um, so 
the the other things that you have to take into consideration that I had to take into consideration is okay where are all the utilities coming from because an accessory dwelling unit that is detached has to be hooked up to your utilities you don't bring in more utilities from the street so even though if you're on a if you're on a corner you're not bringing it in from the street you actually have to tie in to your to sewer, your sewer, line. and what about water? Same water, uh, everything has all to be all of the services other than a vista, or which would you in Spokane can. is electric. So with the water, you can um, meter it separately. <laughs> so you can still have a separate meter out there, but you have to pay twenty dollars a month just to have it. So if you're only, um, you know, if if primarily it's for maybe it's for your office, or maybe you know maybe you're not actually renting it out sure. at any point, or you're having family stay there. Maybe you don't want to meter it separately because then you're going to have to pay. So Yeah, unless you're going to be uh, charging someone for the use of the water, Mm -hmm. a separate metering makes no sense. Yes. Um, And with electricity, you can can expect that you're going to pay just a slightly higher fee because actually any accessory dwelling, whether that's a shop or anything, your electricity is going to cost just you a little bit more. That's how the kilowatt hours are calculated at a higher dollar amount. That's right. Than the primary residence. You got it. Okay. So. But but back to that though, a Vista will separately meter your ADU for gas and electric. You're not tying into the meters on your house. I believe so. I, I'm not gonna. I'm I, not gonna definitively I'm sure say that. I'm sure that that's the case because okay. they would separately meter a shop. Now here is something to. And I know that. Sorry. For, yes. I'm just saying that if they'll separately meter a shop, sure. Of course they would do that for. a accessory so here's something i think that's important to understand is that the owner of the property must occupy one of the units now why does that matter that matters because you might be thinking in your head oh i'll build this i'll live here i'll rent that out then i'll move and i'll rent out the main house and the adu oh you cannot do that okay it is not otherwise now we've moved into a two two unit right it is not treated like a duplex, and and that is so. The application for an ADU, you you get the application, you get an approval letter. That approval letter then gets recorded with the county's office, and it becomes a deed restriction. Oh, interesting. And so it will follow the house forever unless there you can somehow change it. Um, and it doesn't have a separate address, and to try and do that would be a lot of work, um, and maybe not worth it. Um, maybe eventually it would be worth it for someone, but. You have to occupy. So, will how, the city even let you do that? Have a separate address? I mean, the city's I not going to consider it a separate address. Maybe the mailman does. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know. I don't know how that would work because I have not looked into that. But here's what I will say: If let's just say you're a snowbird and you are only in Spokane six months out of the year, that is still okay. You you can occupy the house for six months out of the year and then move. You know, go away. As long as you're there for six months. So six months is that number. That that's is the magic number. That's correct. Well, it follows owner occupancy rules and lending too. Like if you're not in a property for six months out of the year, they they consider it a, either a second home yeah. or a non-owner occupied investment property. So it makes sense that they would follow those guidelines. Right. So the other thing that you can't do, um, well, this is kind of interesting. The total number of people that live in both units cannot exceed six unrelated individuals. Okay. Okay. And the number of related individuals is not regulated. So we could literally have, have my a commune? my whole family could live in the ADU. Bring it on, fam. If you don't know Jessica and her family, <laughs> that is a crap load of people. It's a few people and I love <laughs> no, them all. Nope, it's a crap load. <laughs> um, and uh, another thing that you can't do is uh, you can't have a home occupation. Now, I could, for instance have my office out there, but not a public office. It can't be an office that people are going to be coming to. That's correct. So you've got to be careful of those kinds of I things. I mean, there's tons of restrictions around home offices anyway, even if it's in your primary home. So. Yeah. So I also think that, Matt, maybe I didn't really warn you about this, but there are tax benefits also. Tax to, benefits? Tax benefits. Wow, I'm excited. To having, <laughs> to having the ADU because now you have a rental unit which means that you'll have some tax... Tax write-offs. That's correct. And depreciation on that. That's the word oh I was looking my for. Oh gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so... I really do get excited I know. about what, this kind Can of you stuff. tell us a little bit about wh- how you could see that benefit? As far as depreciation? Yeah. Well, depreciation, 
And I'm not a CPA, as all of you know. I did play <laughs> one on TV once. No, you didn't. <laughs> Depreciation is is what you hear of when you, or when you hear of the phrase paper losses. Mm-hmm. That's what that is. So it's basically saying the value of this um, improvement is, we'll say, a hundred thousand dollars, and they depreciate it, or every year for 27 and a half years in most residential real estate, they reduce that basis. So you get to take that as a, a reduction in your income. So it's this kind of, there's the idea behind it is that the useful life of any building is only so much before you have to then do things to improve it. And so that's the concept behind yeah. appreciation is so, you get to have losses on which would help offset any income that you might be bringing in as a rental. So there's some interesting, interesting pieces there. So let's talk about the cost of an ADU. Obviously, if you're thinking about doing it, you're going to have to do a ton of research yourself. You're going to have to, you know, talk to a good contractor, talk to the city, ask a lot of questions. Um, But how much is it going to cost you? So here's what I I know. That if you're going to do, uh, for instance, a garage underneath and uh, a property on top of that and you're going to do super high end everything okay so everything is going to be top notch in as Spokane, far as it finishes it's finishes um you're probably going to be in the 200 dollars a square foot scenario because remember you've got that and that's only for the upstairs so i'm for the I'm, improved portion of for it. the improved portion but you've got an entire right thing beneath it that is worth something to you um, but you probably could get down to like $130 a square foot. So it just depends on what you want to do, the style of home that you're going to sure. do, how, you know, how much, how much glass is there, you know, how, you know, and how, how much high, tile and... how much high quality, you know, are, windows do you have? The, the, all those things are taken into consideration when you think about all of that. So, um, in, in, if you look at, um, actually there's a great website, it's called Accessory dwellings.org accessorydwellings.org um, it has a lot of information about this and they they actually say that they think that the median is at $151 a square foot of course they're saying as high as $439 a square foot but that's for a different city <laughs> well that's for a different quality of finish is what it is because yeah. I will say this that I have talked with relocating general contractors from California mm-hmm. and they are sometimes uh, floored by how expensive builders in Spokane are per hmm. square foot compared to California markets. Interesting. That like he said that he could build houses in California for cheaper per square foot than Spokane builders will do. Wow, that's amazing. So, um, and you know, take that with a grain of salt. But that's just some conversation that I've had. What else do we know about? Okay, I'm ADUs? I'm almost done here, and I I I just want to bring a couple of things to mind. It's just <laughs> a detached ADU. Um, the roof height is a, is a maximum of 20 feet and, and attached, a detached, okay. detached but an, is 20. a detached over an accessory building is 23 feet. So, so if you are doing a garage, they're not going to stop you at, at 20 feet. They're going to give you an extra three feet. I thought there was a 30 foot number that was, see, that's a, that's a 30 foot number that I saw, but I, I don't believe that it's for, um, residential single family. I don't know that for sure. And that's why I say these are some guidelines and some basic information. Well, and again, once you figure out if you qualify and you figure out the style that you want, then you're, you're going to go down the path into having conversations with the city and all these different parties and contractors and things. That is correct. So 23 feet, boy, that's a, that's a, not much more to have it over the top of a garage. (laughs) No, you gotta be short. No, no, I think it's, I think it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of you know, things to look at. And I, I love this kind of stuff. Like I, I sometimes wonder if I missed my calling as an architect or something <laughs> like that, because I, I love my grid paper and, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, an interesting path to go down and the possibilities seem to be, um, pretty cool. I mean, anywhere between tax benefits, mm-hmm. the benefit to your family from out of town that needs to stay there, you could potentially have rental income, um, it increases yeah. the value of your house. I mean, there's just a lot to... Well, I think next week we're slated to talk about vacation rentals, but I will say this, as far as like what the rental potential rental income for something like that is, is anything from long-term you know, annual or six-month leases to nightly Airbnb to like monthly rentals for a furnished apartment yep. type of a thing. I mean, 
there are traveling nurses, for example, that come in and out of Spokane mm-hmm. that would love to have a f- that will that look for and find furnished apartments that they can rent on a monthly basis. So yeah. there's just there's a lot of options there. I love uh, I love the tax benefits. I love the increase in value, um, and of course, I love the rental income. So yeah, that's great. Well, let's let's do this. We're gonna shift gears now okay. into. You know I love the numbers, so yes. let's jump okay. in and do some economics. How the heck is the world doing in economics? <laughs> uh, let's look at some of the ending numbers for May okay. 2020. Um, and then we're going to dive into the numbers for Spokane as well. Also this week, the Federal Reserve Board met, so we'll have a little bit of update on that. So let's just talk about some economic indicators as we ended the month of May. Uh, I'm sure that this is everybody else's favorite part as well. I think so. I think, I think it's probably I mean, my on. favorite. How the heck are things actually going out there? Uh, vehicle sales, an indicator of what's going on. Vehicle sales improved from 8.5 vehicles in April to 12.2, sorry, 8.5 million. I was like, really? Was We've only sold eight? That's not good. That's <laughs> yeah, not good. <laughs> so 8.5 million okay. uh, in April to 12.2 million in May. So... People are spending money. Maybe it's people doing less mass transportation or transit, things like that, driving to work. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about jobs because jobs drive so much. Layoffs. Uh, so uh, a company that reports this information, Challenger, Gray, and Christmas, uh, reported that U.S. companies announcing layoffs increased by 577.8% in May compared to a May a year ago. Oh, of course. So, yeah. Um, it actually is good news on some level because the year over yeah, year increase. That to me, please. Yeah, how is that good news? Five hundred and seventy-seven percent increase in job loss or layoffs, rather. So it's good news because it's progress. Because the year over year increase in April was one thousand five hundred and seventy-six point nine percent. Okay, so it's so number of it's announced... decreasing slower, or it's increasing slower. Yeah, I mean we went from fifteen hundred to five hundred. So. Okay. Um, Here's here's the title of what this section should be. It ain't great, but it's progress. Okay, I mean that's right. the reality. Right. Like it's... if you want the summary of what the economic, you know, outlook at the moment is, is that's what it is. Um, so here's some other progress. Two point so two million one hundred and twenty six thousand people filing claims uh, this week for unemployment. Sorry, for the week before, uh, compared to this week of one point eight million. I'm, let me start those numbers over because yeah, those were confusing. Again. So this week's Labor Department reported that 1,877,000 people filed for initial unemployment benefits. Okay. Um, the week prior was 2,126,000. So I we're see. down a pretty significant right. number. Okay. Clear progress. However, the reality is that um, since the lockdown started, there's been over 42 million people who have filed for unemployment benefits. Oof. Remember, it ain't great, but it's progress. Uh, all right, let's talk about employment. Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is a this is an encouraging number. They reported two million five hundred nine thousand new jobs created in May. Okay. Uh, this was this many economists were caught off guard because they were anticipating uh, that there would be like seven point five million more lost. Right. So that's right. a ten million swing. Right. That's, I'm, they're I think they're probably still scratching their head. So the unemployment rates fell from 14.7 to 13.5. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and virtually all of the job growth occurred in the industries that have been hardest hit. So leisure and hospitality accounted for almost 50% of the new I mean, is jobs. that just people getting hired back? It's people just getting hired back. Okay, okay. Um, Cause, so but to say but created new jobs is kind of, it's a misnomer a little well, bit. A little bit, but then you said that, that they lost their jobs the right. last time. So if the jobs have been lost, then the jobs have created. been created. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so the reality is is that even with May's job gains, the leisure and hospitality industry has seen a 41.8% of its jobs eliminated at this point. Okay. Um, restaurant reservations. What are people doing? Year-over-year year growth of reservations improved from a negative 82%. Uh, last week to negative 81% this week. So not a lot of change there. Yeah. Uh, Passenger travel, TSA passenger traffic grew from 327,000 to 391,000. Again, pretty pretty flat in that regard. Uh, I don't think that's probably much of 
a surprise to people just where we're still at in, in the world and just, you know, the consumer's question marks on what they're doing and what's going yeah. on. So let's talk a little bit about Federal Reserve and then we'll shift from there into Spokane's local numbers and how that's impacting buyers and sellers. So, mm. I, I mean, again, here's the reality. We're, we got a long haul ahead mm. of us. I think that's, that's what we have to remember. Um, after the Federal Reserve Board met uh, on Wednesday of this week, um, they kind of made an assessment of how quickly the U.S. economy was going to recover, and they uh, were very much suggesting that millions of people could remain out of work for an extended period of time. Their official estimated unemployment at the end of 2020 would be 9.3% unemployment. And you have to have comparisons to give that context, right? So in February, um, we were at, and this actually is, is a quote from them, but um, we basically went from the lowest level of unemployment in 50 years to the highest level in close to 90, 90 years, and we did it in two months. That's mm. a quote from the Federal Reserve Chair. 3.5% was the February unemployment. Okay. So back to like comparing numbers, mm -hmm. if it's nine and a half at the end of 2020, we started, we ended February, or February was at 3.5%. So right. that's nearly three times uh, the unemployment. And that's after we've had six months of yeah. supposed recovery. Right. Um, here's the, I'll just finish with this quote on the Federal Reserve. My assumption is that there will be a significant chunk of, well into the millions who don't go back to their old job. And in fact, there mm. may not be a job in that industry for so for some time. Um, they're really increased uh, projecting. Um, first of all, they're not going to, they've projected out that they're not going to make any sort of rate increases probably through 2022. And that is because Federal Reserve officials are indicating that they expect unemployment to stay elevated for several years. Um, coming in at five and a half percent through 2022. That's not next year. That's the year after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so. Whew, ugh, that sucks. I don't even know how to like process that. I, I think I it's don't. hard to even comprehend that many people being out of work for that long. Because I think I think even during this pandemic, we've we've all thought, well, it'll come back and things will come back and it will be fine. Well, and then you have this this like, hey, this is a V. Like it came down and it's coming right back up. And I think that's not what. Like, that's what politicians are sure hoping will happen, but sure. I don't think the economists and those that are, you know, the smartest, not elected, the smartest people in the they're room. They're not elected officials trying are, to, like, make people feel better. Yeah, they're just like, this is my job to look at economics and forecast. Yeah, so it's a semi-grim outlook at this point. I think it's important that we realize that we are making progress, mm -hmm. that we have to just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that people should just pay attention and proceed with caution. I mean, yeah. I think that you just can't ignore One of the that. things that, that I we talked about a few weeks ago was just the amount of savings in the United States that has increased. And I think that that is its I think that's wisdom. way to go, America <laughs> and the world. Like, you know, just make sure you've got some money set aside if you can. Not only for yourself, but to help our fellow human, you know, because yeah. people are going to need help. We are going to, we're going to have neighbors and friends and family that are in trouble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be able to step in and, and help where we can, I think is going to be important. So let's talk about Spokane's numbers here as we close out for the, the day. Um, we didn't touch on these last week. Uh, let's talk about active listings. Active listings for the last Five weeks, I had to count really quick, in mm -hmm. a row have been going down from 1156 to 1036 to 996 to 695 last week, and then this week at 698. We're up by three. We're up by three. So what is that? Putting it in context, you guys hear me talk a lot about months of inventory. Last week at uh, 695 dipped us below one month of inventory for the first time since we've been doing the show. Um, we're at 0.98 months of inventory last mm -hmm. week. We're up to 0.99 months of inventory this week. That is just crazy. And I, you know, I, I can go into, I'm not going to go into some of the other numbers. I just want to talk about inventory and how that's impacting because the reality is it's impacting both buyers and sellers because of the lack of inventory, uh, values year to date have gone up 10%, 10%. 10 that is 10%. absolutely crazy. For the first five months of the year. First five months of the year, 
That is unprecedented in Spokane. Um, so what that's doing, uh, people are just not putting their properties on the market. And I think there's two big reasons for that. I think they're still a little bit nervous about people, strangers walking through their house mm -hmm. with coronavirus going on. Um, and then I think they don't think they can find a place to buy. Right. Um, for buyers, it's it's the same old story. It's super competitive. Yep. Um, having a strategy when you're out there buying in the market is going to be really important. And so I guess and we'll, honestly looking, you got to look below what you're approved. You, yeah. If you're approved up to 300, you should be looking at 250 because I'm telling you, because it's going to go up to 300 or close potentially, sure. potentially. So, all right. I think we'll end with that and, um, be encouraged that this too shall pass. And, um, you know, the market is interesting right now, and that's why we continue to look at it. And so next week, we're going to talk about vacation rentals. There's some pretty uh, interesting things that we're going to be able to go through with you on that. So thanks, Wakam, for joining us. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.